In 1985, Marty McFly travelled to Hill Valley in the year 2015, where he paid a visit to a blast from the past antique store. And everyone got so caught up in looking at the Jaws NES Nintendo game, they completely overlooked the Jaws 2 VHS tape. Incidentally, I do have that VHS, because of course I do. Yep, Jaws 2 is the one that always terrified me. It is definitely the one out of all four movies that is balls to the wall horror and has a real foreboding feel about it. I honestly don't get the criticism that this movie tends to get, as it has the same look and feel as the original, only it turns up the intensity. From a movie making standpoint, Jaws 1 is better, but that was a very high standard set. But in all honesty, I actually find Jaws 2 to be scarier. It's darker, grittier, and the nastiest Jaws of them all. And to top it all off, the shark is deformed in this one, displaying terrifying burn scars on its face, making this Jaws the Freddy Krueger Jaws. As a matter of fact, Jaws 2 really does feel like a contemporary late 70s horror slasher movie, what with a deformed killer killing off a heap of teenagers. And of course, the movie also deals with themes of Martin Brody having a nervous breakdown, with no one believing him that a new shark has swam its way to the shores of Amity Island for some fine tourist dining. So welcome to Jaws 2, aka the one from the late 70s where everyone has their sideburns and flares. If the original Jaws movie was the definitive shark one, and Jaws 3 was the 3D one, and Jaws the Revenge is the revenge one, then Jaws 2 is without a doubt the scary Saturday Night Fever one. So let's return to Amity Island and look into 10 things that you didn't know about Jaws 2! The sequel to the first one, making it part two of the series. Let's check it out. telling you and I'm telling everybody at this table that that's a shark and I know what a shark looks like because I've seen one up close and you better do something about this one because I don't intend to go through that hell again number 10 director swap naturally Steven Spielberg was offered to direct Jaws 2 by its producers David Brown and Richard Zanuck but he turned them down as he wanted to make close encounters of the third kind instead Spielberg felt that he had already made the definitive shark monster movie with Jaws, and he wanted to go on to make Spielberg movies, not Jaws movies. So John D. Hancock was brought on board to direct. Hancock had previously directed the early 1970s horror movie, Let's Scare Jessica to Death, and would go on to direct Wolfen. Hancock had different ideas as to what Jaws 2 should be. He wanted to tell a tale about Amity Island being like a ghost town after the events of the first movie. And he also wanted to touch up on themes from the original Jaws novel that were left out of the first movie, such as ties to the Mafia. Universal Pictures weren't happy with this and wanted the sequel to be more of a simplistic Chief Brody has to save a heap of teenagers from a shark scenario. Hancock wanted Amity Island to look almost apocalyptic and the locals of Martha's Vineyard weren't too happy with this, with only one store in that area agreeing to board up its windows to get the desired deserted look. After a month of filming, Hancock was removed from the movie, because Universal felt that the tone of the movie he was making just wasn't right, and it just felt too dark and morbid. So French director Gino Schwartz was brought on board, as he had previously directed the movie Bug, which like Jaws, was a creature feature. Only it dealt with cockroaches. Gene o. Schwartz would actually go on to have a very interesting career, as he would go on to direct Somewhere in Time, the 1984 Supergirl movie, and Santa Claus the movie. So clearly the guy has range. Number 9, The Intense Roy Scheider Feud. Originally, Roy Scheider was to star as Michael in The Deer Hunter, but he walked off the project, which left him available for returning as Martin Brody in Jaws 2. Scheider didn't want to return, but didn't have a choice as he was under a movie contract deal with Universal Pictures, who simply scooped him up and put him in Jaws 2's production, which obviously created some tension on set, particularly with the movie's director, Gino Schwartz, as the two would frequently clash and have arguments. 
After one incident involving an onset argument in front of the cast and crew, producers David Brown and Richard Zanuck held a meeting for the two men to put their differences aside. But the meeting resulted in an apparent physical fight, which the producers had to break up. Once again, this is apparently. But yeah, for whatever reason, Scheider and Schwartz really were not seeing eye to eye. Scheider was so keen to get out of his contract, he even supposedly tried to convince everyone that he had gone insane and had some kind of episode in his Beverly Hills hotel room. I think the fact that Roy Scheider was so angry and on edge while making Jaws 2 actually helps the movie, as it went with the whole Martin Brody having a mental breakdown subplot. There are moments in the movie where it looks like Scheider is completely losing the plot. Well, that might not have been acting. Number 8. Famous Tagline the most famous tagline associated with the Jaws film series is just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water. In fact, many people often connect this tagline to the original Jaws movie, when in fact it was created for Jaws 2. After all, the sentence says just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, as in going back to the Jaws series. But regardless, Jaws 2 may not have been the most memorable movie, but it still delivered one of the most memorable and celebrated movie taglines ever. A sentence still celebrated and ingrained in pop culture to this day. The tagline is also constantly parodied too, also making it one of the most parodied movie taglines. All you need to do is say, just when you thought it was safe to insert word here and everyone gets it and straight away knows exactly what you're talking about. So Jaws 2 may not have been the most celebrated movie to some, its tagline would still go on to leave a major imprint in pop culture. Number 7. The comic book is the best thing ever. So Marvel released a comic book tie-in for Jaws 2, and I swear it's the best movie comic book of all time. This comic, unlike the movie, which was restricted by a PG rating, takes no prisoners and turns up the gore to 11, probably making it one of the most gruesome comic books of its time. This comic seriously has guts, which actually shows detailed scenes that we didn't see in the movie, particularly more graphic scenes of Jaws eating people. Like here, where I'm near certain that he's biting that girl in half. And remember the scene where Jaws attacks the helicopter? Well, just look at it here in the comic. Holy space balls, is that epic. The comic even adds explosions, making that scene even more intense. This Jaws comic makes Jaws look just as menacing and as threatening in the comic books than he does on the big screen. Yep, not many people come out of the Jaws 2 comic in one piece. And just when the comic couldn't be any more badass and awesome, the back cover features the band Kiss. Yep, it doesn't get any more awesome than that. Number 6. A Jaws 2 survivor then got terrorised by a Stephen King monster. So Jaws 2 features a cast of young teenagers who get terrorised by the shark in the middle of the Amity Island Sea. And one of the characters is Doug Fetterman, who was played by Keith Gordon. Did you see the way she was looking at you? I mean, she wants you, man. Nah, she wasn't looking at me. Who were going to star in another horror movie classic, Christine, in the John Carpenter movie based on the story by Stephen King. Gordon played high school geek Arnie Cunningham, who gets obsessed with a strange supernatural 1958 Plymouth Fury, aka Christine, a mechanical hell beast that destroys his soul. Yep, in 1983, a whole five years after Jaws 2, Gordon was still playing high school teenagers. In the Jaws 2 documentary, Gordon spoke about some of the experiences with Jaws 2 and how they all had to get trained by a drill sergeant style trainer. And during the making of the movie, there was lots of friendships, partying, and sex taking place within the group. Uh, a little bit too much information, but okay. In later years, Keith Gordon has become an accomplished director, having directed many TV shows, including episodes of the Fargo TV series. Number 5. Multiple Movie Posters Out of all the Jaws movies, Jaws 2 has the most movie posters made to promote it, unlike the others which just had one. 
The main Jaws 2 poster is this one, where we see Jaws' head is looming over a water skier. I don't know why they didn't use the original Jaws illustration used for the first movie, which would go on to be used for the next movies. My guess was to make him look more monstrous, which he does. But this monster design just doesn't look as iconic as the other, more realistic one. I love, 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 love this red poster. It tries something different, and seeing the fin popping out of the water with the blood red sky and sea just looks really menacing to me. The whole poster is beautifully drawn and just screams danger. Like, as in this water right here is somewhere that you really don't want to be or you will be destroyed. There is almost something primeval or prehistoric about it. This one amuses me. Like, I get the logic. It was Jaws 2, so let's have two sharks. Seriously, how awesome would Jaws 2 have been if there actually was two sharks? Then there is this poster, which harkens back to the original poster. Maybe a little too much so. What I like about this poster is that you can clearly see the Tina character is trying to help Eddie and save him from the shark. Unlike the movie where she does absolutely nothing and just stares awkwardly, while Eddie is literally getting ripped apart. <laughs> Yeah, good one, Tina. Because of you, Eddie is now brunch, destined to become a Jaws sandwich. Rest in peace to Eddie and his brilliant disco hair. Look, even the powers that be behind the Jaws 2 record had the common sense to use that poster. See how she's reaching out to Eddie to lend him a hand to actually help him on the boat? Well, if you haven't seen Jaws 2, don't expect that to happen. Number 4, Jaws 2 was briefly the highest grossing sequel. Sequels always have a reputation of never doing as well as their predecessors, but for its time, as far as being a sequel goes, Jaws 2 actually did really well. It earned $208 million on a $30 million budget, which is very impressive making it the highest grossing sequel of its time. However, this victory was very short-lived, as the next year along came Rocky II and knocked Jaws 2 off its mantle and replaced it as the highest grossing sequel. Yep, it seems that Jaws was no match for a down-on-his-luck boxer from Philadelphia who dreamed of making it big. Speaking of movie posters, what the heck even is that? What was the creative process behind the Rocky II poster? Whose genius idea was it to just have a big black square of nothing as the movie's poster? Was there a board meeting about how that poster should look? In which someone said, I know, have a big square of nothing and that's it. And then someone else was like, by God, he's got it. Give that man a pay raise. Speaking of sequels, Jaws 2 is the very first Hollywood movie sequel to actually use the number 2 in its title, as opposed to the popular Roman numeral approach that is often used. Number 3. Real Life Shark Terror As with the first movie, there was many difficulties and problems with filming on the sea. However, one incident that took place behind the camera probably no doubt actually looked like a terrifying scene from a Jaws movie as Mark Gilpin, who played Michael Brody, claims that while on the raft that the teenagers had put together in the movie, a hammerhead shark started to circle their raft, leaving the terrified actors screaming for help. But the crew were several miles away filming another scene, and just assumed that the youngsters were getting into character and ignored them. Thankfully, nothing happened. Otherwise, just imagine being an actor in a Jaws movie and, well, actually getting eaten by a shark. That'll suck. Number 2. Presidential Promotion Susan Ford was hired to visit the Jaws 2 set in order to snap up some photos. Ford is the daughter of Gerald Ford who was the President of the United States when the movie was being filmed. Many of Ford's photos would go on to be used in the behind the scenes novel called The Jaws 2 Log. And some of her pictures that she took really do give an insight into the production of Jaws 2. And she even managed to appear in some of the photos herself. It's knowing things like the president's daughter helped in the behind the scenes of the Jaws book, which makes being a pop cultural detective totally worth it. Speaking of locations, notice how in the beach scenes in Jaws 2, the beach actually looks much larger than the beach scene in the first movie. Well, that's because the beach scenes in Jaws 2 weren't filmed at Martha's Vineyard like the first movie, but instead they were filmed at Navarre Beach in Florida. 
The beach scenes were filmed in that location because director Gene Oshwartz wanted to film there, because of the warmer weather and because the waters were deeper, which he thought would help when it came to using the mechanical sharks. Filming did return to Martha's Vineyard, but after a scathing local newspaper article was written about Jaws 2's production and how annoying it was and how the production was here for money, some locals weren't as welcoming, even wearing t-shirts saying, Universal, go home. But that said, many of the locals were actually happy and excited with another Jaws movie being filmed at the location, and many of them were even extras in the movie. Bonus entry, the strange aging condition affecting the Brody boys. The two Brody sons of Michael and Sean are just like the Griswold kids from the Vacation film series, in that every time we see them they have been recast. But what is strange is that each time these characters are recast, they seem to have huge age jumps. For example, in the first Jaws movie, Michael and Sean Brody look like very young children. In Jaws 2, which came out three years later, Michael now looks like a fully grown young adult, and Sean looks to be approaching pre-adolescence. In Jaws 3D, which came out five years after Jaws 2, Michael is now an engineer at SeaWorld, looking like he's about 30, and Sean is now a cowboy. And I always thought that the Sean actor from Jaws 3D was that guy from Return of the Living Dead, but no, he isn't. And then in Jaws The Revenge, which came out four years later, Michael once again looks like he could be in the late 20s and early 30s category, along with Sean, who also looks to be about the same age. Going by the timeline with Jaws coming out in 1975 and Jaws The Revenge coming out in 1987, Michael should have been 24 and Sean should have been 19. In fact, I've tried really hard to make sense of how these two guys keep drastically aging and where it all fits in the Jaws timeline, and thus how many years are set in between each movie. Well, in the original Jaws, Michael Brody actor Chris Rabello would have been about 11 to 12 at the time of filming, and Sean actor Jay Mello would have been 6 or 7. So we then jump to Jaws 2, which I've actually always assumed was set one year after the first Jaws movie. But this time, Michael Brody was played by Mark Grunner, who was about 20 at the time, and Sean was played by Mark Gilpin, who would have been 12. Okay, so let's give Michael Brody the benefit of the doubt and assume that his character is 17. After all, often in movies, actors in their 20s play characters who are in their late teens. So this, along with Sean's age jump of being 7 to 12, would have set Jaws 2 five years after the events of Jaws 1, in which Jaws 2 would have been set in 1980, two years after Jaws 2 came out. That's if we're to accept these age jumps of Michael and Sean in between these two movies. Then in Jaws 3D, which came out in 1983, Michael Brody actor Dennis Quaid was 29 at the time, and Sean actor John Putch was 22. So this would have set Jaws 3D in 1989, nine years after the events of Jaws 2, and 14 years after the events of the original Jaws. But along comes Jaws the Revenge to muck everything up. Now, to be fair, Jaws the Revenge retcons Jaws 3D, as if that movie never happened. And Lance Guest, who plays Michael Brody in that film, would have been about 27 at the time of filming. But if we're to assume the character is slightly younger, like let's just say 24, then that actually ties in with him being 12 in the original Jaws movie, which would set this movie in 1987, the year that it came out. So we've nearly got the timeline on track, but then they had to screw it up with the Sean Brody character, as Mitchell Anderson, who played that part, was 26 at the time of filming, just one year younger than Michael, as opposed to the usual seven to eight year gap we've previously had between the two characters. And no, he's not just an older actor playing a younger character either. As in Jaws the Revenge, Sean Brody is now the deputy of Amity Island. Okay, going by the Jaws 1 timeline, Sean should have been 19, so maybe we're to assume that Sean is a very headstrong, career-focused 19-year-old who worked very hard and became a deputy at an extremely young age. Anyway, tell me your theory on the aging issues with Michael and Sean. Could it be genetic issues? Or could it be aliens? Or could it just be that the cast and crew of the Jaws movies themselves don't even know the ages of, of Michael and Sean? Or am I looking too deeply into it? Let me know. Number one, Jaws 2 was originally going to be a prequel. As hard as it may be to see in hindsight, but Jaws 2 was originally conceived as being a prequel to the original Jaws movie, focusing on the character Quint as a young man. 
In the original Jaws, there is a scene where Quint tells a haunting story where it's revealed that he served on the USS Indianapolis during World War II. And after its sinking, there was a terrifying ordeal that he had to go through with the sharks preying on him in the water. Well, Jaws 2 was going to focus on that, a World War II drama, where Quint has to survive the ordeal of terrifying sharks after the Indianapolis sinking. Although the idea would have been ambitious, producers David Brown and Richard Zanuck wisely chose to move the story forward instead of backwards, and felt that in a Jaws sequel, people would want to return to Amity Island and to see the Brody family again. In conclusion, to me, Jaws 2 kind of feels like two movies in one. The first half feels like it's about Chief Brody going through post-traumatic stress after surviving the events of the first movie. And I feel like the movie plays out with us not knowing if Brody is mad or not. I wonder what it would have been like if we didn't see the shark killing people, with it being questioned if people were just dying due to tragic circumstances. So thus we wouldn't know if a shark was behind this or if Brody was genuinely losing the plot. That definitely would have made for a more psychological Jaws movie. The second half of the movie changes, where it becomes a slasher movie, with a bunch of helpless teenagers getting killed off by a movie boogeyman. In this case, Bruce the Jaws Shark. And why not? After all, Jaws 2 came out the same year as John Carpenter's Halloween. So both these two different storylines mesh together to make Jaws 2. And I wouldn't want it any other way. It's not a perfect movie, but I do love how dark and brutal it gets. So to me, Jaws 2 is, and always will be, a worthy sequel. Well guys, that was my look into Jaws 2, and it's honestly not a bad sequel. In fact, I would argue that it's a great sequel. It captures the look and spirit of the first movie while upping the stakes. And I stand by my claim that Jaws 2 is the scariest Jaws movie. It may not be the best, that is definitely the first one, but it is the scariest. So I say give it another viewing and keep an open mind. Anyway, I'm Minty, and just when you thought it was safe to return to YouTube, I upload another episode. See ya!